All right, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 1. Daniel, chapter 1. And I really enjoy reading the book of Daniel, and I don't... Uh, I'm one who doesn't pay attention as much to all the prophecies and such, but um, I, I really enjoy the, the things we can learn from the stories, especially the first few chapters. Uh, I think there's a lot of practical things in there, and we'll be looking at one of those stories and talking about some of the other ones briefly, but Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, so we're going to cover this morning. So when you get there, please stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word. Daniel 1, verses 3 through 7. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace in whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you again for this blessed day. And Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us as we read and study your word. Lord, that, uh, that it would enrich in our hearts, our minds. And Lord, as we look at the practical applications, Lord, that we're able to, to use those in our daily life. Lord, and when we look at who we are, Lord, that we find our identity in your son Jesus Christ. And, Lord, that we relate to that in everything. Lord, again, we just want to thank you for this opportunity, and I just pray that everything that is said, Lord, will be to your glory. Lord, it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Excuse me while I move this down a little bit. It just seems a little loud. Now, in today's society, there's an ever-growing emphasis on identity. Okay, you have this thing called identity politics, where it's based, you know, the politics is based on maybe skin color, or, you know, something, some kind of box you could check off on a form. And so it matters more now than ever. It's always mattered. We always see that identity is important. The things that make you who you are is important. But there's also more emphasis on it now today more than ever. And it comes down to, you know, whether you're white or black, whether you're rich or poor, or male or female, white collar, blue collar, whether you're educated, whether you're uneducated, whether you're immigrant or native, you know, what kind of job you have, who you're married to, who your parents are, who your kids are. You know, all those things identify us. And there's a lot of people that put a lot of stock into those things. And some people look at them, you know, depending on what boxes you can check, you know, that has a say in whether, how disadvantaged you may be, how much harder it is for you to get ahead in life, or it may give you advantages, this thing called privilege. And that's being thrown around a lot today, and it's all going back to these things that identify you. Again, whether you're white, whether you're black, rich, poor, male, female. And with the emphasis on all these things nowadays about identity, you know, again, race, where you're from, where you live, the country you live in, all these things, what are Christians to do about it? How are we supposed to look at those things? 
Now, I will contend, and I think this is the biblical point of view, that we are to have none of it, care less. And I think the Bible is clear on that. And I'll just be honest, it gets tiresome for me to see people promote who they vote more so than promote Jesus Christ. And it's aggravating to me to see people who focus more on their ethnicity than who they are in Christ. Or people that's more proud to be an American or maybe proud to be Southern or Northern or Tennessean than realizing that the Bible says they're a pilgrim and a stranger walking through a land that's not their own. We're citizens of a heavenly kingdom. And we are to keep our eyes on those heavenly things. And I know that goes against a lot of what people believe and a lot of what they focus on, but what it boils down to, I'm a child of God, a follower of Jesus Christ. All this other stuff is circumstantial, doesn't matter anything about my eternity. And so when we look at the Bible, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6.20 that we are bought with a price. That means we are not, we're, we're not our own. Okay? And so that, that means all those things we identify with in regards to the flesh and this world, they belong in a dung heap with all of Paul's accomplishments before his conversion. Because when you look at Paul, he says, hey, I was a, a Jew. You know, a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. All these things. He looked at his education and he said he counted them all as, as dung. And so if you look at society today, it's a lot of things that we take a lot of pride in. It's a lot of things that we want people to know about us first. But Paul said what? It's dung. It's refuse. It's trash. It's garbage. I want no part of being recognized or affiliated with any of that anymore. He could care less that the fact that he was a Jew or that he was born in Tarsus. He had, he had no care for that. And so we can learn about a lot about this identity with Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, I know, especially the last three names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, we mostly know them by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, that's not the names that their mama gave them. <laughs> and so, and the thing is, too, the names that their mama gave them or their dad gave them, maybe God gave them, they give glory to God. And, and you could tell Daniel wrote the book because afterwards, the only time he references being called Belteshazzar is when the kings or some of the Babylonians call him Belteshazzar. But he calls them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego throughout the rest of the book. Go figure. Daniel made sure he was known by... His Hebrew name. But like Melinda said, they were all likely teenagers when they were taken from Judah into Babylon. Now part of the reason why they were chosen was because of their identity, those boxes they could check. Okay, Verse 3 said that they were of royal blood, children of Israel, king's seed, and of the princes. They were probably descendants of David. And so Nebuchadnezzar was trying to take the best of the best of the Hebrews and turn them into the best of the best of the Babylonians. Verse 4 it also even gives a little bit of insight on their physical characteristics. They were well favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge, there was no blemish, understanding science. So basically, they were good looking, they were smart, and they had a whole lot of understanding. You know, these are the, and of course, they were royal blood. They probably had money, too. These are the kind of guys, if you have a daughter, this is, you know, might be what you would be okay with them bringing home. But that's what Nebuchadnezzar picked the best of the best because he wanted them to be the best of the best in Babylon. Because it says that they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So when we look at names a little bit, many people today, when they try to choose a name for a baby, there's really not a lot of meaning to it a lot of times. They pick a name that sounds good. You know, this middle name's got to sound good with this first name. You know, and there's, 
We don't have something, that, we don't pick anything that has a deep meaning or stands for something. Now, you take my name, for instance, my middle name, Bart, is after my grandfather. That has some meaning. But Dennis, because Mama didn't want me to name me George. Well, that's the meaning, I guess. But in the past, people had a meaning a lot, a lot more so than now in naming their children, and it was especially so with the Jews in the Bible. You know, when you look at the Bible, God tells Abraham and Sarah, you shall name his name Isaac, which means laughter, because Sarah laughed. Or in the book of Isaiah, it says he shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Talking about Jesus Christ, that he is God with us. Or what he told Mary and Joseph, you shall name him Jesus. Why? Because he shall save the people from their sins. There was meaning in the name. And sometimes it, it seems rather trivial, but you look at Esau's name. You know, Esau's name was just because it means red, because he was hairy and red-headed. You know, Jacob grabbed his heel. His name means the supplanter or the deceiver, and we see that in his actions. But in the case of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their names all glorified God. Daniel's name meant God is my judge. Hananiah's meant God is gracious. Mishael, his name meant God is without equal. And then Hananiah's meant that the Lord is my helper. Now, it, to me, it sounds like you can tell that they're from the line of David because all those things are something David wrote about in the Psalms. God is my judge. The Lord is my helper. There is no equal. But their names were their main identifier. And it's who they were in their relationship with God. Now, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't have their names glorifying the God of heaven, the God of Israel. And so, what did he do? He changed their names. And such is the ways of the world. If being a Christian is very prevalent in your identity, the world will seek to silence that part of your identity. We've seen it firsthand. <clears throat> and it comes from all sides. We, we see it, and it's closest to us, in the form of a lawsuit. You can't talk about God. You can't show your faith in God. Not if you're an adult. The students still can, but if you're an adult, you can't act like you know what praying is. Or we see it in, you know, maybe some kind of a peer pressure because you don't grow out of being able to be exposed to peer pressure, okay? Peers just mean it's somebody your age group or whatever, and you still experience that as you get older or tempted shame or commands maybe in a workplace that, hey, you can't have that Bible on your desk. You can't have that cross on your desk. You can't talk to them about church because... They have freedom of religion or whatever. They twist the Constitution to try to silence us showing people that we're children of God. And we see it in ourselves and what we expose ourselves to and what we let overtake our life because so many times we become known more by what we do for a living or what we like to do as a hobby than who died for our sins. And it's a great increasing majority of people that are like that. So Nebuchadnezzar again attempted to change their identity by changing their names. And so Daniel, whose name meant God is my judge, was changed to Belteshazzar, meaning Baal will protect, which Baal... They look at it could be just a title of a, a random deity, but a lot of it associated with the, the deity Marduk that the Babylonians worshipped. Hananias was changed to Shadrach, meaning inspiration of the sun. Mishael's was changed to Meshach, meaning belonging to Aku. And then Azariah's was changed to Abednego, meaning servant of Nego, which was another God. So they took all the reference 
to the God of Israel, the God of heaven, the true and one only creator God, they took it away. And then gave them the, an association with false gods. Now, these aren't the first and only names changed in the Bible. You see that pretty regular. Pharaoh changed Joseph, Joseph's name when he became the governor of Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar also changed Madonai's name who became King Zedekiah. And then we know that God changed people's name when he changed their identity. And I was thinking about that this morning, how that would just be an awesome experience to go through if, if God came to me and said, you know what, you're no longer Dennis, but you're this, and it has a significant meaning. That would be awesome. But there were some people in the Bible that experienced that. The obvious ones we know are Saul to Paul. We don't know if God changed his name. We just know that it... He changed what he went by at some point. But Saul in the Hebrew means prayed for, which sounds, you know, good enough. But I was thinking about the name Paul. It means little. And so it really puts into context what Paul talked about, all those accomplishments that he had that built himself up, that built his identity, that built his reputation but yet he calls it all dung now, and, and it kind of like what John the Baptist, I must decrease and he must increase. Paul became something little in his mind. That stuff that he had accomplished before didn't mean as much. We know Abram was changed to Abraham. Abram means high father, which sounds relevant enough, but when he went to Abraham, it means father of multitudes. You know, so he wasn't just going to be a father. His offspring was going to be as numerous as the sand of the seashore, as the stars in the sky. Sarai to Sarah. Sarai means contentious or quarrelsome. But Sarah means princess. Yeah, Savannah gets a kick out of that. <laughs> Simon Peter... Simon's name means listener. Peter in the Greek Petros means rock. And then Jesus said you will be called Cephas, which is Aramaic for stone or rock. And so Simon, you know, being a listener sounds good, but Jesus said you're going to be a rock. Jacob to Israel. Talked about a while ago, Jacob, it means supplanter or deceiver, and Jacob was a deceiver. Okay, he deceived his father Isaac to receive the blessing. But I bet he was extremely relieved to be called Israel later on, which there's a lot of different meanings. Uh, some people say it means wrestles with God and prevails. Some just leaves it at wrestles with God. But I think... Uh, wrestling with God is, is sufficient because we also see his offspring wrestled with God in a way for a long time. But he was no longer known as the deceiver. So God changed who they were. Their names meant something. They were not the same person anymore. And Nebuchadnezzar sought to undo what the Hebrews' boys' names reflected, their relationship with God. Now, he also not only sought to change their names, he wanted them immersed in Babylonian society. All the way down from the food that they ate to the things they studied, the things they read, they become astrologers and magicians. They studied the stars and this, that, and the other. And that can do a lot to a person when they're not looking at God's Word. If you're getting your education secularly and not biblically, but they were immersed in Babylonian society, the literature, the language. They were to serve the king. And they were to play an integral part in the houses of magicians and mystics and astrologers. And it kind of being in the world and Nebuchadnezzar wanted to be of the world. Nebuchadnezzar sought to wipe out anything of their previous Hebrew identity. And he failed miserably. So we look at ourselves 
no matter how much the world tries to change our identity in Christ, no matter how much they try to push that part of us aside, no matter how much we try to push it aside, we have to remember that our actions still tell the story of who we are. Daniel refused to eat the unclean meat in chapter 1. Like Melinda said, they just give us vegetables. You know, and some people say that that meat was either offered as a dedicated to idols or it might have been pork or whatever, but Daniel, by the commandments of God, knew he wasn't supposed to eat it and he wasn't going to compromise on that. And God rewarded him for that. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah refused to bow down to the image of Nebuchadnezzar when they played the music. And regardless of the punishment that was promised, they did not change. They said, this is who we are. This is our identity. Yeah, you've, you've set us up in this high position in your government, but look, there's still a God who created the heavens and the earth, and that's who we are. That's who we belong to. And I find it telling when Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, don't you know I can kill you? I'm going to throw you in this fire. I'll give you one more chance. Bow down to this image. And they said, look, whether God saves us or not, and he can, whether he saves us or not, we're not going to bow down. Daniel refused to stop praying every morning, noon, and night. And, and the leaders in Babylon, they, they knew the only way they could get anything on him is in how he served his God. They knew that was the one constant with Daniel. And so that's when they tricked the king and say, hey, won't you write this edict that nobody can pray to anybody but you? But Daniel, being aware of the edict, what did he do? And he didn't hide it either. So he left his window open, faced Jerusalem, and prayed every morning, noon, and night. And was willing to take the punishment of being thrown to the lions. Now for us, you know, we compromise when somebody just threatens us with a loss of a paycheck or some shame or what have you. It don't take lines anymore. In all these instances, they were attacks on their identity in God. Every one of them. But their actions spoke loud and clear. Now even when they weren't really being persecuted, they still maintained their faith. You know, it wasn't, hey, I'm going to pray to God and act like it's in the bad times. But they were faithful in the good times too. When you look at Daniel and how he prayed, when times were good, and then Daniel was asked to interpret dreams or some mysterious hand writing some things on the wall, he didn't go in and say, yeah, I can translate that or I can tell you what that dream means. What did he do? He said, I can't, but i tell you who can that may use me, and that's God. Because he had every opportunity to lift himself up and take some pride and say, hey, yeah, I can tell you what this means. No, he said it's God who interprets dreams and visions. He gave God the glory. Now, as we, as ambassadors for Christ, our identity should truly be in Him. Our thoughts, words, and actions should reflect that. If we call ourselves a Christian, then what we do should reflect the fact that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And so many times, that does not happen. And we're all guilty of it, every single one of us. Uh, you know, I made a comment this week, you know, and how some things that happen may look bad on myself. And, and I said this, I've done enough to make my, me look bad that I can't change. I've done enough to tarnish the name of Dennis Crosley. But what pains me now is if I do something that tarnishes the name of Jesus Christ. Because that is what's important in my life. That is who I identify with. That is what I want to be known as. You know, when you work in the funeral business and, and people 
you know, say we have a funeral, and there's a lot of things that people won't know about them in their life. If they served in the military, they may want to, the medals on display and, and this things of that nature. If they like to restore cars, they'll have pictures of their cars. But shouldn't we all just want people to know Jesus Christ? Shouldn't we all, even in our last rites, and people are celebrating the life that we lived, I want it said that he served God. And if they can't say that, that falls on me. I want to be known by serving God. And so as I said before, when I... If our identity is in Christ, all that other stuff means nothing. The fact that I'm white, the fact that I'm male, bald, good looking, whatever it is, it means nothing. I eat a lot of vegetables. (laughs) But all that means nothing. Absolutely nothing. All those boxes we check. None of that stuff exists on the other side of heaven. When uh, when we get our glorified bodies, we can't choose from different models. And biblically, that stuff shouldn't matter now. It shouldn't. Galatians 3.28 and Colossians 3.11 it says about the same thing, but I'm going to read from Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there bond nor free, neither is, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. None of that matters. The fact that you're Jewish, Greek, American, Northern, Southern, Canadian, Mexican, Paul's saying there's none of that. Neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now we'll kind of rehash some things that we studied on Wednesday night. The perfect example of that is Acts 13.1, the church at Antioch. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And so when you look at those people who made up the church at Antioch, who led the church at Antioch, okay, you have Simeon that was called Niger. You know why he was called Niger? He was black. He's from North Africa. Then you have Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was a country in northern Africa as well. Then Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, he was of some esteem, raised in some wealth and privilege. And then it's got Saul and Barnabas. Saul, a Jew who was born in Tarsus, and Barnabas, a Jew who was born in Cyprus. You can't get any more different than those individuals, yet they led the church, and the church thrived and flourished. You don't see that much today. If someone of a certain ethnicity moves into a neighborhood, they try to find a church with that ethnicity. But yet back in Antioch, there was one church. They had leaders of different ethnicities, of different backgrounds, different financial upbringings. And they made it work. Why? Because they were all one in Christ Jesus. And again, we don't see that happen much today because we want to amplify these fleshly identifiers more than being in Christ. We like to put adjectives before the word Christian and saying who we are. You know, and and I'm talking about the adjectives of whether you're liberal or conservative or white or black. We put those adjectives in front of Christian when the Bible says we are all one in Christ Jesus if we believe the gospel. If we are born again, if Jesus Christ is our Savior, it says we're all one. Now I'm going to read a few verses here that are common. They get quoted a lot, but uh, I think they speak to the point. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, 
He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, when I became born again, those identifiers that I can identify with were, you know, white, male, straight, whatever. Those things are put to death along with my old self. They don't matter. Now, there's things within being a Christian that is important of being a male and being a father and things of that nature. But that all falls under the umbrella of who I am in Christ, not on its own. So my occupation and everything else, that doesn't matter anymore when I become born again. Remember, it said there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. That stuff doesn't matter as much. They are to be put to death to make room for Christ living in us, being indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not, that, it's not I that live anymore, but Christ who lives in me, the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works with Christ which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. When we become born again, Jesus Christ, we're his workmanship. He made us. He built us. He gives us a new heart. And then in 1 Peter 2, 9, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are to show forth his praises because he called us out of darkness and brought us into light. We are not to compromise. Too often we do. We're able to put aside who we are in Jesus Christ to let some other part of our identity gain prominence that has no business gaining prominence in our life. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah certainly didn't compromise. The world did its best to change their identity in God, and it's going to do its best to change yours in Christ and who you are. But, as Paul wrote, this grace in which we stand, That's who we are. We are to be bold in our stance on the Word. Be bold in who we are for Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and then the Greek. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed to preach Christ crucified. Don't be ashamed to Tell people, yeah, my Savior, He rose again. He was resurrected. And you know what? I will be too. Don't be ashamed of that. Because that's what saves us. That's the truth that we live by. I'm going to close with one quote by Charles Spurgeon. And it's in regards to us talking about Jesus. Preaching about Jesus. And too often, many people get nervous. Well, I can't get up there and speak about Jesus. I can't talk about this. Charles Spurgeon said, When we preach Christ crucified, we have no reason to stammer or stutter or hesitate or apologize. There is nothing in the gospel of which we have any cause to be ashamed. We have no reason to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He's one who saved us. We have no reason to be ashamed of who we are in Christ because He's the one who gave us a new heart. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank You and praise You again for this.